think one of the strengths of our team is how close we are individually and collectively. And um, that's allowed us to, in tight games, believe in each other. We know we can look at the guy on our left and our right and know that we have each other's back. Um, but for the trip for me, you know, I'm a half Korean. So the fact that I was able to go there for the first time was very special. Personally, my mother and brother were able to be there. And that was really special for all of us. And just being able to play the games it was really the first few weeks I was able to be with the team um, since I came over. So just the fact that I was able to get some run with these guys was great. And it's definitely been very beneficial in our progress early in the season to now. On the left side, third row. For Max and for Evan, Coach was talking yesterday about how Irvine's always kind of in the shadow of USC, UCLA down there. Does this kind of week feel like a, a chance for you guys to, to break out of that shadow? Yeah, um, we definitely have the opportunity to do that and kind of done that up to this point. But at the, at the same time, we're not getting too caught up about UCLA and USC. Just want to focus on what UC Irvine can do. And we got a chance to go to the Sweet 16, which a lot of people didn't expect. Um, but, you know, we had big goals set out in mind you know, since training camp. So we're definitely excited for the opportunity. Yeah, just like, just like he said, uh, we're, just, we're not focused on USC, UCLA. Uh, focus on Oregon, you know, that's our next game. And, you know, we're focused on where we're at right now, where we're trying to be, so. On the front, right back on the third row. Uh, Robert, how difficult of a turnaround is it for you guys to flip the switch to, to Oregon and you know, learn about their length and, and their athletic ability. Is, is it really difficult for you guys to, to scout uh, in that 24-hour period? Yes and no. Um, and that's the good thing about the college season is you have to do that game to game. And we've had tournament experience where we've had completely different teams um, that we've had to scout and play back to backs or with the 24-hour window. Um, but we maintain the same level of preparation for every game throughout the season. And we're not going to change now. But Oregon is obviously a very good team. We know that they're doing a heck of a job defensively, made it really tough on teams, held teams to very low scores. So we know we're going to have to execute and play as good of a game, if not the best game we played all year to beat them. But we believe that we can. And we're going to prepare all the rest of the day and all tomorrow to get ready for that. Go left again, but six rows back. Uh, Josh Chubau, Associated Press. Uh, Max, if the last few years, you've know, had a bunch of different teams go from lower seeds to the Final Four of the Loyola last year, being the latest. Do you guys sort of look at that and say, why not us, that you guys have the ingredients to do, make, make that kind of run? Um, I mean, obviously, that would be amazing. But you know, we're just focused on this next game. And if we can make a deep run, you know, obviously, that is a goal. And that's something everybody you know, in the program and on the staff and on the team would love to do. But like I said before, we're just focused on this next 40 minutes and just taking it one game at a time, one possession at a time, and, and see what we could do. Right side, fourth row. Alan Johnstone, Scoop Duck. Is there a team that you've played this year that has a lot of similarities to Oregon, anything that you've used to prepare yourself for this game? Um, I would say, uh, well, the coaches have been saying a little bit like a team in our league, Cal Poly. I mean, obviously, the Cal Poly is not as skilled as Oregon is at all, but they kind of play the same matchup zone. That's similar to what we'll face tomorrow. So we've been kind of looking at film at that and just expecting, you know, switching defenses and focusing on what we do on offense to execute. <coughs> Left side, third row. Elston, interested in your scouting report on Oregon, what, what you've seen from the Ducks on the last 24 hours you guys have scouted them? Uh, not much so far. Um, they're a long athletic team, so we just got to – us play smart, play discipline on offense. Um, that's pretty much so far. We just looked at that, like their athleticism and the, their ball pressure. Left side, fifth row. Evan and Max, your defense is second in the country in two-point field goal percentage. Why is your defense so successful? What do you guys do well to, to accomplish that? You want that? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I just feel like we definitely come up with good game plans. Our coaches, staff. Uh, I feel like we just have, you know, a lot of good guards on the team, a lot of good bigs, and we're able to play well together. And uh, like I said, we're the, the the guys that we have are able to, you know, just make the game plan that the coaches have, able to just make it come together. So, uh, left side, uh, front row. 
know what that is. <laughs> Max, how many uh, text messages did you get yesterday? And how cool is part of this experience is just, you guys don't get a lot of attention, you don't get a chance to face us a whole lot. How, how, how much uh, do you appreciate or how much do you enjoy just being a, a chance to talk and you know, kind of sell yourself in the program? It definitely still feels somewhat surreal. Um, you know, I haven't really even gotten to respond to all the texts yet. And all the media attention is definitely really cool. It's something that I guess we all, you know, would have dreamed of. And just dreaming of playing an NCAA tournament, but to be able to get a win and put ourselves in position to get another one and potentially go to Sweet 16 is pretty cool. And definitely putting on, you know, for the school, for our families, and for all our fr uh, families and friends back home. So definitely pretty cool. And we're going to see how, how long we can keep playing. Third row. This is for any of the guys, several of you guys can answer this. Um, so much is made of uh, the Cinderella teams in this tournament every single year. And I guess UC Irvine can be looked at as this year's Cinderella. Do you guys feel like the Cinderella team, or, 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 do, you f um, or do you feel differently a, a about that? Um, <clears throat> no, we don't really look at ourselves like that. Obviously, as a 13 seed, not many people projected us to win as maybe the four seed. But we believe in ourselves. And we looked at our matchup against Kansas State and believed we had a really good chance to win. And we look at the matchup against Oregon as another team that we're going to have to play very well, but we have a chance to win as well. And however the media wants to portray us, but we don't, we're a 31-5 team that's played against high-level competition all year. And we've had great up, um, road victories throughout the season. And we don't see ourselves that way, but we understand that might come with our seating. But we look at ourselves as a high-level team that can compete with a, pretty much anybody. And that's why we're, what we're going to continue to show, hopefully, throughout the rest of the season. Um, I think from the outside looking in, I think a lot of people are shocked that we're here. But I mean, since the beginning of the year, like Max said, in training camp, our coaches said that we're not going to be satisfied with just being in the tournament or making it to the tournament. We believe that we can advance. So for us, this has been a goal all year long, not only to make it, but to advance. Additional questions? No? Sounds like we're good. Thanks, Thank fellas. You. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Reminder, the locker rooms are open, and we will uh, have Coach Turner in about 15 minutes. 155.
All right, we well, welcome head coach Russell Turner to the dais. Um, just a reminder, no video in here, uh, just uh, still photography, and uh, the locker rooms are open at this time. And your cell phones, if anybody, just check those for mute. That would be great. We'll open the floor for coach for an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to questions. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for being here as an opening statement. Just want to say how proud I am of my team. Um, how excited I am for the UC Irvine fans and alumni and community uh, to be able to enjoy our team's success um, for another couple of days as part of this great event, the NCAA basketball tournament. Great. Front row on the left, just name and affiliation on the first time. Uh, Mark Wicker, Orange County Register. Oregon has been on a great defensive spree here the last 10 or 11 games when you look at the stats. Um, and obviously, you've played good defenses before. What's what's unique about this challenge for your offense? And is it a matter of you know if we just play our offense, we you feel like if you play your offense, you can still get your shots, or are you going to have to do something special? <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to have to play a special game to be effective. But we did that yesterday um, against a team that's actually a better ranked defense than Oregon's. Um, and that takes nothing away from Oregon. Oregon is incredibly improved, and that's a credit to their players and their staff. Um, they've got unusual length. You know, they've got uh, size and length more like an NBA team than a typical college team. So the looks that they're able to give to teams are different, and I think they've figured that out as this season has gone along. Um, they challenge – you know, each team they, they face in multiple different ways. They don't just challenge you with the way they play man-to-man. -man. They adjust the zone. Sometimes they make one thing look like the other. They often surprise teams with traps. Uh, they remind me in many ways of playing Louisville in 2015. Um, I thought that we were able to prepare in 2015 well for that game. We had longer to get ready. But I thought that the preparation in 2015 had occurred throughout the course of the season, not just in the week that we were playing. Uh, there's nothing that Oregon's going to show us that we won't know how to handle, but they're going to show it to us with guys that are hard to handle. Uh, so we're going to have to be really good. Uh, but we're different from what they are, and that can cause them problems too. Go on the left side, fourth row. Uh, Josh Dubow with Associated Press. Uh, Coach, what, what, made you, what makes uh, Coach Blaine the sister Jean of UC Irvine? I hear you gave that <laughs> nickname. You know, I, the other day at our uh, watch party, I was addressing the fans who were there, and what I said was that, you know, a year ago, Loyola Chicago was in the same position that day as we were. And at that time, Loyola Chicago had had a record of 28 and 5. And we were 30 and 5. And Loyola Chicago had created great momentum around a veteran group. And we've done the same thing and probably even won more games in a row at that stage than they had. I don't know that to be true. But I also said they had a secret weapon that everyone remembers in Sister Jean, and that we also have a secret weapon that no one knows about, and it's Uncle Blaine. Um, so it was a play on words, you know, as a way to entertain the crowd. But Blaine is special for our team and our staff. You know, Blaine has 380 Division I wins. Um, you can see that if you look it up. But more critical than that, he's just, an, he's just a talented basketball person, uh, a, a coach, a motivator, um, a lot of different things that I was able to see up close when he and I worked together for Mike Montgomery here in the Bay Area in 2000. And we also won 30 games that year. And 30 games in college basketball is rare air. Uh, so I remembered and was watching very closely what I saw from Blaine and then went on to follow him when he went to Virginia, where I'm from, to be the head coach at Old Dominion. And so when I had an opening on my staff, the opportunity to bring him back made so much sense because he was at a university in Old Dominion that's very similar to UC Irvine, and he accomplished everything that we wanted to accomplish. He won multiple conference championships. He won multiple conference 
tournament championships. He made the NCAA, I think, four times. Even once got an at-large bid and advanced in the tournament. Uh, so when we won our conference tournament the other night, one of the things I said to him when I gave him a hug was, hey, this is, this is why I brought you here. And I had that same feeling Friday when we won in the NCAA tournament. You know, he had done it at a school like ours and uh, has been a big part of us finding the way to also do it at Irvine. Front, uh, left side, second row. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> I know that I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but when, whenever you look at teams that they were that term mid-majors, everybody talks about Gonzaga, that's no longer looked at that way because they've done it for 20 years. What are the things, when you look at them, what are the, the things in their path to doing this that are applicable to a place like UC Irvine? Of course, you see others like Wofford and others, but w what's applicable to, to your place where you could say, well, why can't we do that too over the long term? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you can, go, you can make a long list. Wofford this year, um, you know, Davidson, um, George Mason, you know, VCU. Um, there are more. You know, all those places have done, you know, what I'd like to dream that maybe we could do. Um, and we're, I mean, hey, this year we're on the way. You know, who, who knows what's still possible for us. We're clearly making progress in the right direction. And I think that's what's critical. Gonzaga didn't become what they are now in a short window. They gradually got better. They continued to improve. And they were committed to sustaining their success through the investments they, they made as a university. I believe the same things are all possible at Irvine, um, just as they've been at the other schools that I've mentioned. I don't get to just decide that that happens. Uh, but I can do my part really well, and that's uh, that's what I've been focused on trying to do. And I do think we've developed as a program an identity that suits us and our community and our university really well. I think the type of guys that we attract now are the type of guys that we can continue to attract. And as we do a better job at identifying even better players, and we benefit from – days like we had Friday and opportunities like we have today and tomorrow, we can also get better and better. Third row in the front. Russell Warren Williamson, Oregon Duck Football News. Um, I asked your players this question. What we love so much about March Madness is the Cinderella stories, obviously. And I asked him if they felt that, that they were a Cinderella, and that could be taken as a derogatory <laughs> term, you know. But how, how do you look at this team? Do you... Do you look at yourself as, as a Cinderella story? I don't know. I mean, yeah, kind of. It depends on what that means to you. You know, Cinderella, yeah, not every guy would like to be called that, I don't guess. Um, I don't mind it because I think it's, it's you know, a, a positive expression for teams in this tournament that, uh, that do something special. Um, that's how I think of the term. What it really means is underdog. And nobody minds being an underdog. Um, nobody knows better than we do that we're underdogs. Um, but that doesn't really matter. You know, you got to – that's the great thing about this tournament. You get to settle it in a rectangle. And what your seed is doesn't matter. You play for it. And that's what we'll get a chance to do tomorrow. So if they call us Cinderella, that's fine. But I think we've earned everybody's respect, whatever they call us. Back, to, back there. That was a long time ago, but you guys went to A&M and won. Um, and the things that you learned about yourselves that night and what's translated into now, because that's, you know, that's a power five <laughs> team with a lot of good athletes on the road. Yeah, that was an important night for us uh, to win that game. As you said, it's a power five opponent um, with outstanding athleticism, you know, that really tried to challenge us, and we withstood that challenge. Um, it was a shock to us early in that game. They got off to a big lead, you know, because it was hard for us to adjust to their size, strength, 
length combination. Um, but we were able to adjust and stay in the game and figure out ways to execute the things that we thought we would be able to execute in that matchup. And then we got lucky in the end, you know, tossed one in with six seconds left to go up by one and, um, and withstood the last six seconds to win. Uh, but knowing, even if had we not won, I think our, our team would have emerged from that day knowing that we can play with anybody. Um, that's what we truly believe. Uh, that doesn't mean we can play successfully on every possession against anybody, but we think we can figure out a way to have a chance in any matchup based on the experiences we've had together and the depth and talent of this roster and the combination of skills our guys have. Uh, back left, about six rows. Uh, Hayden Herrera, NBC 16, and Eugene. Uh, you mentioned the length Oregon has, but uh, at the at the point guard spot, Peyton Pritchard, he's shown his ability to take over a game. What kind of threat does he pose to your team tomorrow? Well, he's played outstanding, especially recently. And uh, anybody who's watched Oregon knows that. You can look at his numbers. He's not only scored at a high level, but uh, he's the one that gets easy shots for all of his teammates. Um, and he's also an incredible game manager, I think, for them in, in the run that they've had. Uh, so he's an outstanding point guard, one that, uh, that we fully respect. I think we've got a great matchup for him. Um, and Robert Cartwright, who's also a veteran, and uh, it won't just be Robert's job to um, disrupt the rhythm that, you know, that, uh, that he's had. We'll try to do that as a team. Um, but we've been pretty good as a, as a team, our, our group has, when we focused on the other team's most critical players. Uh, so I think he's got his hands full with us, just like we do with him. Any additional questions? Sounds like we're good. Thanks, all Coach. All right, thank you all.
Okay, we're ready for the Oregon student athletes as uh, Paul White and Kenny Wooten will be joining us today. And we'll go, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, reminder, no video, just still photography in here. The locker rooms are open now for about 40 minutes or so. And uh, we'll open it up, just put your hands, we have mic holders on either side. Just your name and affiliation on the first question. So we'll go front row to the left. Uh, yeah, Jeff Miller from the LA Times. Uh, Paul, what um, this uh, team turned around its season over the last few weeks here. What what's been the key? What what happened after that uh, trip to LA, and just kind of what's happened since then? Well, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happened was after the USC game, um, coach after the game just really emphasized uh, having a positive attitude. Um, I think. Throughout the USC game, we kind of lost some of our composure. And uh, he told Francis Okoro that um, because of how positive he was throughout, throughout that entire game, he was going to start for the UCLA game. Um, we started a big lineup. Uh, it was me, Peyton, Lou, uh, Kenny, and Francis. And um, ever since then, I think that lineup has kind of, uh, you know, been a staple for this team right now. Well. It, not only that, but, you know, it's also kind of uh, encouraged uh, people coming off the bench um, to, I, I believe, to have that same positive attitude, to have uh, a certain kind of energy about them when they do get on the floor. And uh, ever since Coach has kind of emphasized having a positive attitude and a positive energy, uh, this team has kind of just gone in a new direction. And... Um, you know, ever since that L.A. trip, I think that we've been a more cohesive group, a, a more mature group, and, um, you know, it's really, you know, uh, showing. On the right side, second row. This is for both Kenny and Paul. Warren Williamson, Oregon Duck Football News. Along that same line, Dana talked about that story on Thursday. He talked about his anger and maybe that being a defining moment. What do you guys remember about that moment specifically was there any anger amongst the team, and were you as maybe disappointed as, as Coach Altman was at that time? Um, no, I don't think the, the team was angry at all. I think we all kind of bonded together at that time and realized that we really had to depend on each other, and we had to pick each other up because we weren't going to win games, you know, doing the same thing. It's kind of the definition of insanity, so we realized that we had to change. Ooh, we realized that we had to change. Uh, and get ready for the rest of the season. I think UCLA was a big start for that. And then after that, we just realized what we had to do to win. Yeah, um, I kind of remember that moment. Uh, I think <clears throat> it was some people that were kind of uh, frustrated, not only just, you know, with, with, with each other, but I, I feel like people were kind of just frustrated with, like, the performance that they were just giving at that time. I know I was frustrated with myself. Um, but... Coach um, rewarded, I think, the right person uh, at that moment. Uh, Francis, throughout that entire game, he was just in people's ears, like, come on, come on, guys. Um, you know, we got this. Let's stay together. You know, and he's very aggressive in how he tells you. You know, like, he'll, uh, he'll grab your shoulder. You know, he'll almost grab your face mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of break it down to you. But um, I think – in that moment, uh, you know, what I want to give credit to are <clears throat> the people that are coming off the bench. Um, you know, we've changed up the starting lineups a lot. And uh, I think, you know, this team has done a, a great job of kind of um, maintaining their ego, egos and putting it to the side and, you know, just putting forth a positive energy for this team. On the left side, about five rows back. Mark Wicker from the Orange County Register. Uh, Kenny, how can you tell that you've intimidated someone after you block a shot in the in the way in the next few trips when they come down? And uh, Paul, when can you tell that Kennedy's in, Kenny's intimidated somebody? Oh, I don't intimidate people. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just play with you. I'll just play with you. I'll just play with you. Um, usually, when I can usually tell when I made an impact on the defensive end is when like teams they'll drive and be real aggressive and then once I block a shot or two they'll tend to like drive and 
try to like stop or kick it out or they'll like shoot a lot more threes. Like you'll see a lot more three point attempts. And that's when I realized that I'd done my job because it's a higher percentage shooting them outside than inside. Uh, I mean, I see, I see it when, just like what Kenny, just like what Kenny said, um, when teams start to kind of stop in their tracks, they start to give multiple head fakes. Also, when um, I think when Kenny, you know, he kind of lets sometimes he lets you know, you know, like when he blocks a shot, and you know that 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 can kind of play into <clears throat> that mental mind game where you know. Um, it's not. It's not about being unsportsmanlike. It's just about being celebrating that play at that time, and as a player with pride, you know it, it is one of the things that you just don't want to happen. Is to just have your block, your your shot blocked like that. So, you know, it start it starts to kind of seep into people's minds, and you know, I think so far over this stretch of the games that we have won, he's done a great job of uh, really planting that seed in people's heads. Additional questions? The front row again, to the left. The uh, the seedings of these two teams isn't vastly different, but the perception certainly is the two programs. Do you guys feel like you're a good, you're about to play a Cinderella? No. Um, we've heard the background of this team that they haven't lost since January. Um, no matter what conference you're in, uh, no matter what division you're playing in, that's still pretty tough to do. I think they won, won 30 plus games this year. Um, uh, we've watched them. We watched uh, some film on them. We watched them play some yesterday. And, um, you know, they're a very smart but fast team. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that we have to take into account. So, you know, they got into this reason for, they got into this point for a reason. And for that, we for sure have to respect them. Um, Definitely not a Cinderella, though. Additional questions? We'll go in the front, second row. You guys did this in the Pac-12 tournament in Vegas, but because you did back-to-back-to-back -back -back games, how difficult is it here to flip that switch to scout a team like UC Irvine and, and get prepared uh, for that game tomorrow? Oh. Um, I wouldn't – well, I mean, it's kind of difficult, you know, because – you have to completely scout a whole different team that you never scouted before throughout the entire season. And um, being able to play, I mean, I mean, it's it's a blessing to be able to play right now, but it's kind of difficult being able to play games right after the next and have a whole different scout. It's just, it's, it's hard, but I mean, not too many people are playing, so I can't complain. Yeah, I think. <clears throat> Uh, I told somebody this before, I think kind of in this setting, it's important to know uh, the other players' tendencies probably rather than uh, so much their plays. So if we d start to um, really study what they do out on the floor, which, you know, kind of carries over no matter in whatever play that they are running, um, I think that's something that we've done very well uh, with, I think, in Wisconsin, <clears throat> you know, we really – paid attention to their tendencies and what they did well and probably some of the things that we could exploit. But I think with this team, um, you know, just kind of drilling in uh, what their um, strong, you know, what their strong suits are and kind of, you know, just going from there. Yeah. One more here on the, on the right. This one's for, for Kenny. Jordan Bell had a lot of memes two years ago about his blocking shots. Have yeah. you seen the ones about you? And do you enjoy seeing uh, the, the <clears throat> highlights on ESPN of you blocking shots? I mean, you were talked about a lot last night uh, about your game against Wisconsin. Yeah, it, it's always great to, you know, turn on the TV and see him talking about you. So I, <laughs> I really I enjoy that. And I did see uh, the I think it was like a hashtag, like things Jordan Bell can block. And then I remember them. Uh, <clears throat> talking about that, and I remember being like, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to feel like that, and, you know, it's truly a blessing being able to see things like that going on for myself. All right. Oh, we'll go one more. I'm sorry. Back left, fourth row. Kenny, you guys have been on such a great defensive streak uh, the last, what, eight games or so, or since UCLA. Um, 
and the th the different things you do defensively, the the man, the, the press, the zone, and, and and Russell Turner was talking about how the man sometimes looks like a zone and vice versa. How, how much do you sense teams getting uh, confused or tentative by not being able to figure out what you're in? Uh, uh, it it is kind of difficult to realize what type of defense we're playing at the time because a lot of teams really don't know like what type of plays to run against our. It's like a man or a zone. Yeah, don't tell them. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell them the secret. But yeah. yeah, they they really will never know because they run different types of plays for the defense that they see, and then they'll like run a zone play, and really we might be in something completely different. So it's kind of it's hard. Like we're throwing them off balance, and I think we're doing a great job of that. All right, we good? Thank you, fellas. Thank you. Locker rooms are open. We'll have Coach Altman at 2.40, which is about eight minutes from now.
There's one up here. I thought that was one of your approved ones. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, welcome, Coach Oregon Coach Dana Altman to the dais. Um, we'll have Coach give us a brief opening statement, then we'll open it up to, to questions to the group. Well, we face a very difficult task tomorrow. Uh, Irvine is really a, a good basketball team. Anytime you see a plus seven on the rebounding and their defensive numbers, uh, you know, really impressed with what I've been able to see. And you win 31 games, that's not by accident. Um, 17 in a row, and we think we, we're kind of on a roll because we won nine and, and they've won 17. So uh, good ball club, deep. Uh, experienced fifth-year seniors, guys that have played together a long time under Russ's system, uh, very well coached. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to make some of the mistakes we've been making uh, and be successful. So, very difficult game for us. Um, one day to get ready, and and uh, I'm hoping our guys will get to rest and be ready to go tomorrow night at, at 6:40. Questions on the right side? Second row. Coach, kind of along that same line, how easy is it, or how difficult, I guess, is it to flip that switch and scout a team like that in such a short period of time? You, used, you do it at the Pac-12, but you've seen those teams before. How do you do it in this position? Well, we've, we've had a couple coaching assistants working on the games, you know, possibility of playing Kansas State and, and Irvine, you know, we we went to work on those teams uh, just in case we were in this position. Uh, so, you know, Kevin and I worked on uh, getting ready for for Wisconsin, and then the other coaches were, were working on, you know, and so now it's just getting ready for them. And we had a lot of information, a lot of tape ready to go, and, and the scouting report was ready to go. It's just now getting it across to the team. You know, it doesn't matter whether I know it or – the assistant coaches know it. It's how much our guys know, and and so you you go back to what you know you believe is a, a defensive philosophy, a rebounding philosophy. You try to apply those things. You know shots that we can't give up. Uh, you know shots that'll get us beat. So you know we talk to them about those types of things and their, their offensive sets to try to get those shots. So you know I, I think they'll be ready. We're you know this. One thing about playing in the Pac-12, you know, you play a lot of Thursday, Saturdays, you know, Thursday, Sundays, so you're used to the one day off, you know. So the, the Friday, Sunday um, doesn't bother us. We're, we're used to having a day to get ready for the next opponent. And uh, in that regard, I think our routine throughout the season helps us. Go in the uh, six rows back in the middle. Speaking of the Pac-12, is there a team in the Pac-12 that reminds you of Irvine or that Irvine reminds you of? You know, not really. Um, you know, back a few years ago, Arizona, you know, used to play the big guys and, and uh, really try to beat you up in the lane. And uh, defensively, when you drove it, you know, everybody collapsed. Uh, so going back to some of those good Arizona teams, you know, I, I think uh, that's a little bit of similarity. Uh, you know, they shoot the three well. Uh, they're a little slower paced than most teams in our league. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I guess going back a few years, some of those Arizona teams that, that were big and physical, you know, the four guys, they rotate inside. Uh, you know, they just, you know, they're physical. They try beating you up. That's why they're a plus seven on the boards, you know, and why they don't give up anything in the paint. Uh, they're not afraid of foul trouble. They're not afraid to be aggressive. Additional questions will come back in the front on the right. Dana, we were talking earlier about how fun this tournament is because of all the, the Cinderella stories, you know, the, the underdogs or the mid-majors. Um, but this doesn't necessarily seem like a, a Cinderella team that you're going to be facing. As you said, it's a team that's won 31 games. Um, does it seem, I guess, I asked the guys, does it seem like a Cinderella matchup to, to you or to the team? You know, I haven't talked to the team about it, so I don't know how they feel about it, but I don't. You know, I, you know, I look at their ball club and, um, you know, it reminds me of some of our good Creighton teams back when we were in the Valley. You know, we never thought of ourselves as Cinderella's or underdogs, and I'm sure they don't either, you know. Uh, so, you know, 
they don't think of themselves as Cinderella, and, and I sure don't. Uh, again, I haven't discussed it with the team, and you know, so I have no idea what they're thinking. But uh, as a coaching staff, we definitely don't. You know, they're they're a big physical team. Uh, Kansas State, you know, they're Big Twelve co-champs. You know, and and if you watch the two teams, you can see any physical difference in the teams. You know, it. it didn't look like Cinderella or Goliath, you know, David and Goliath. It, you know, looked like two good basketball teams. And uh, so their athleticism is good. Their depth is good. Again, they're playing guys that are older, red-shirted, you know. So, you know, we've got four freshmen that we're trying to play. And, and so it's kind of a different makeup of our team compared to theirs. Theirs is an old physical team, and, and ours is kind of a young team that's trying to figure things out yet. Go on the left. Uh, Hayden Herrera, NBC 16, Eugene. Uh, Coach, uh, I, don't, I know you're not on Twitter personally, but uh, uh, Jim Levitt, Oregon's former de defensive coordinator, had some well wishes for you yesterday, he called you a, gr a great friend. What does it mean to just, even though he's not connected to the university anymore, he still got that uh, support from a, a fellow coach, maybe not in the same sport, but a, a fellow coach? Well, we probably should have talked to Jim about our defense earlier in the year, uh, but uh, no, he's he's a good friend. We we've known each other for uh, you know thirty years. You know our relationship goes back uh, you know to, to eighty nine ninety when when he came to Kansas State. So I've I've known him for thirty years, and uh, uh, so you know that's the great thing. We even had some K P State people cheering for us last night. So uh, you know uh, I was there a long time ago. Went there in eighty six and and spent seven years there. So. Uh, two of my children were born in Manhattan, so uh, a lot of good memories. But no, I appreciate everybody who's, you know, we've had a lot of people reach out. Uh, a lot of people know how frustrated we were throughout the year. It wasn't going quite as planned, but uh, it is sure good to, to have everybody on our side now that uh, we're playing a little bit better. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go back. Yep, yeah, come up here. Second row, and then we'll go back. Danny, you talked to the other day about um, teams that shoot well behind the arc and running them off off the line. This is a team you see Irvine that can shoot well from the three. I think they got three guys that shoot pretty well. How do you defend that and and still rim protect at the same time? Well, you know, we're probably not going to ask Kenny to get out there too often, and you know, we we've had a little problem when teams have really spread us out, but. Um, you know, we, we can't let Hazard get going. I mean, he's proven when, you know, he gets going, you know, he's, he's a handful. And, uh, uh, you know, their other three-point shooters are consistent too. You know, they actually have five guys that, you know, that we're kind of concerned about. So um, we're going to have to do a good job of locating those shooters. You know, they're going to hit some, but we just can't give up uncontested ones. You know, if they hit contested threes, that's just part of the game. You know, and, and uh, there's some nights where teams are throwing it in and there's not a darn thing you can do about it. But, um, you know, we just can't give up easy ones or ones that they consistently get in their offense, you know. So when you're watching film as a coach and you see, you know, a player getting a shot consistently and knocking that shot down, you know, those are the ones you show your team and say, fellas, you know, we can give up this one, but this one's going to hurt us. And hopefully in a day our guys understand that and, we don't give up too many of those those looks. Anything additional? <coughs> Looks like we're good. Thanks, All right, Coach. Thanks. Okay, we're at uh, 249. Locker rooms open till about three, and then Liberty student athletes at 310.
right, folks, Liberty is en route uh, to the interview room. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, just a reminder, there's no video in the room, just uh, still photography. And we'll open up to questions for the, the student athletes. Locker rooms will be open at this point, too, for about uh, 40 minutes. All right, we welcome Liberty student athletes to the dais. Uh, we have Mayo Baxter Bell, Elijah Cuffey, Georgie Pacheco Ortiz as well. Um, fellows, we'll have, uh, I'm just going to open up to questions. We have microphones on either side. Uh, just a couple of reminders, just to, if you could just check your cell phones, make sure those are on mute. And then uh, before your first uh, question, just name and affiliation. So we'll get started. Just hands for questions. We'll go in the, uh, in the front row. Thanks, guys. Uh, Michael Phillips with the Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, could you guys just share what the last 24 hours have been like since getting the school's first win in history? Uh, I mean, I thought it was a, a fun experience. Uh, can't really describe it. Uh, I mean, it was just out there just having fun playing basketball for me. Uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, a lot of support from my family and fans here. So. It's been great to do this for our university and kind of bring something back uh, to Lynchburg. So it's been great. Yeah, like they say, you know, a lot of support for for our school and uh, family and friends. Yep. Question? Uh, yeah, go on left, third row. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Joel Anderson, ESPN. Um, this is for anybody. Uh, what do you guys remember about the exhibition game from earlier this year against Virginia Tech? Like, how did that? How did that go for you guys? Uh, it was a good game. Uh, I remember, I mean, we uh, we had some stuff that we could do, we can need to get better at. But it was a great experience for us, uh, far as since, I mean, that's our next opponent. So we're excited uh, that we get to get a chance to play them again. So we learned a lot about ourselves and about them. Anyone else? No? OK. Uh, the question? Or do you want to, anybody else want to answer? Or? All right, we'll, we'll go to the next one. Back in the back left standing. Yeah, guys, I uh, just asked about the exhibition game. Um, Georgie, I guess for you, uh, do, do you, obviously it was a special moment for you with hurricane uh, funds being raised, but uh, is there anything that you can really take from that game, being that it was that long ago as far as an X's and O's thing? Or, I mean, how much better is this team since then? Yeah, I think that, that was uh, kind of our first kind of first game uh, playing together as a team. And I think we, you know, we, we have gathered throughout the season, and the season go along. So uh, we learn from each other a lot. And, uh, you know, and we learn from, this, from that game, and I think – as you guys know, knows, like we got better throughout the season, and you know, there's another opportunity for us just to uh, get better uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's game, and you know, uh, try to try to do uh, what we didn't do at uh, that exhibition game. Back in the front row. How was the trip to In and Out Burger? <laughs> Questions? Let's go back in the fourth row left. Mayo, uh, describe that experience last night and what you were able to do to go out there and make yourself so effective from both ends of the floor. Uh, it was a great experience. I mean, coming off the bench, you, you get to see what the team's lacking. You get to see what you need to bring to the table, bring to the team to help us get over that hump. And uh, like I said, Scotty didn't get off to a good start as he wanted to. But like I said, that's what we have teammates for. I mean, you know, he 
I mean, he's a really good player, and he has really good game, and I mean, he scores a lot of our points for us. So, you know, I was glad I was able to come in and give us the lift that we needed to get over that hump, so that uh, we can come out and be successful. Any further questions? Yeah, come back in the front row. George, what does it mean for you to be representing Puerto Rico as, as a player in this tournament? Uh, it means a lot just because uh, it's a lot of a lot of uh, athletes from Puerto Rico, born and raised from Puerto Rico, and they don't have this uh, opportunity just to be able to play in a on a tournament like this. Like it's, you know, it's pretty big, so it means a lot. So I can you know, uh, I can. Uh, Serve as a role model for for younger kids that want to be in, in my position, uh, some sometime in the future, and uh, yeah, it just means a lot. So representing my my country and my family back home. Yeah. Back on the left, Elijah is as good as their guards are for the Hokies. Uh, they like to shoot the three as well. They they shoot it well. Uh, how much of a challenge is it going to be? For you guys to uh, to keep them in check from that standpoint, uh, it's going to be a big uh, a big challenge. Um, I don't think everybody on our team is ready to accept that challenge and take it on. Uh, it would be fun to go up and people with those uh, that big of names and that big of a team. I think it's just always a challenge and ready to accept it. Left second row. Uh, Mark Berman in the Roanoke Times. Um, how how has this team evolved? your team since that uh, exhibition meeting back in November when you played them the first time? Uh, it's Dan Nystrom. Like, we've came so far. I mean, we let – early in the year, we let mistakes get to us. And uh, I think we let mistakes bother us and sometimes affect the outcome. But uh, this team today, we've overcome a lot of mistakes. We're able to make mistakes and be able to rally and pull, pull each other back together. And uh, – just put ourselves in a, in a great position to win. So, yeah. Back there. Um, you know, obviously you, you won at UCLA this year. You, you beat Mississippi State last night. So does that kind of contribute to the mind? What, what's the mindset going into the playing Virginia Tech? Do you kind of look at it like, so what's it, the four seed? You know, we, we've beaten big, big name teams before. Or what's kind of the, the conference level going into this game? Uh, we like to talk about uh, staying in our lane. So. Uh, not getting too ahead of the moment and just doing what we do every day. Uh, we play defense and we try to take good shots on offense. So we're going to stick to what we've been doing, playing good defense and uh, trying to take good shots. And I mean, we don't really, we're not getting too ahead of ourselves. We don't really look at the numbers. I think seeds don't matter. I think, I mean, I think it's been proven that, that the numbers really don't matter. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we all have to go out there and lace up. So. Stay with Mark. Is, is it with a quick turnaround game like this? Is it helpful at all that you, you played them in an ex exhibition game in November, or did that game was that game so meaningless that it, it, it you really can't uh, you know get it, get anything out of that this time around? I wouldn't say the game was uh, meaningless. I think that uh, just playing a team and seeing a team before is uh, helpful, especially this late in the season, or uh, knowing their personnel and and uh, how hard that they play. That uh, it helps us as far as preparing for them t for tomorrow. As for each of you or whoever wants to answer it, but have you guys, has it set in yet what you accomplished last night in terms of big picture and biggest win in school history? I mean, it, do you, have you all thought of, I mean, certainly it's been exciting over the last 24 hours, but how much have you thought about it? Yeah, of course we, I mean, we've been thinking about that science, we, you know, science last night after the game and but you know we just you know we already enjoy it we celebrate but now we you know we gotta worry about our next opponent so uh, uh we know that you know we we made history we we making uh we we accomplish uh, our goal but you know we want more so we we don't want to end uh our season so yeah anything additional sounds like we're good Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, so we're at 318. We have a, a coach, um, Kay, will be here at uh, 330. So we've got about 12 minutes for the locker rooms if you want to run down there.
Okay, we're just about ready for Liberty Coach Richie McKay. Um, just a reminder on a couple things. We'll, uh, no video here, just still photography only. Uh, cell phones, if, if give those a quick check, see if they're on mute. And uh, we'll have Coach give us an opening statement, and then we will uh, open it up to questions. This hasn't been drank, so. No, no, it's fresh, <laughs> just for you. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. We're excited to be here. Uh, obviously, uh, round of 32 and uh, had a fun evening last night because uh, it was just neat to see our guys stay collected and, and connected. And uh, having a chance to advance is, uh, is really special. So we're excited about the opportunity. Great. Uh, we have folks on either side for mics. Just name and affiliation on the, uh, the first question. Just hands. And we'll go on the second row left. Mark uh, Berman, the Roanoke Times, congratulations. Thank you. Um, in, in, a, in early November that you were there side by side with Buzz in the, in, in the post game uh, press conference mm -hmm. talking about how long you guys have known each other and all that. Have you had a chance to kind of sink in and reflect that, you know, here <coughs> you are kind of coming full circle and now you're going to be, you know, uh, the two teams, the two coaches on the, on the same court in the NCAA tournament now tomorrow? I, I never really thought about it. Uh, when we had won the ASUN championship uh, against a really good Lipscomb team, in Nashville, and I started looking at some of the bracketologists. Uh, there were a couple of them, including uh, Joe Lenardi, that said we might play Virginia Tech. And I think Buzz and I had one conversation during the week um, that was unrelated to that. And I started asking him about, hey, if we play you, do we need to change our calls? Because they'll have every single call. He's got 76 people on his staff, and um, I'm sure. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but uh, I, I have the utmost respect for Buzz Williams. I, I think uh, not just as a coach, he's a really, really good coach. Like the stuff they run offensively is nightmarish to prepare for. Um, I was back at the hotel probably 1030 and started watching film and I finally gave up about two something. Like no way to prepare for all that stuff. But, uh, but Buzz is also a, a wonderful person. Not many people know all the things that he does uh, for people. And I hope he doesn't mind me sharing, but um, I, I know a few coaches who have lost their jobs uh, during this time of year, and Buzz just, he just loves on them. Like he'll fly them into Blacksburg or to the ACC tournament, pay all their expenses, bring their children. He's, and, he, and he never ever talks about it, but I, I can, I know four of them that he's done that for, and, and he does it out of his own pocket. He, he's, he's an exceptional person. Uh, I really, really like him. and. Uh, but I want to beat him. Stay on the left side, third row. Joel Anderson, ESPN. Hey, Coach, um, did you permit your, uh, you said you were watching the film by 1030 last night back at the hotel room. Did you permit yourself a chance to enjoy this? Did you do anything to celebrate, you know, the, you know, the school's <laughs> first uh, tournament win? Um, n not really. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm very competitive, so, uh, I mean, it was it was nice enjoying it after the game with the guys, a celebration in the locker room, and uh, once I started the Virginia Tech stuff, I, I didn't stop much. Uh, so yeah, I enjoyed it. I like I had a lot of text messages that I tried to reply to most. If I haven't gotten to them, I apologize if you're listening to this press conference. Um, <clears throat> but I'm obviously excited. This is a, this is a, the most enjoyable time of year for coaches and players and. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm competitive and want to prepare for Tech best I can, but uh, I also know this is a great privilege and honor that we have it. Stay right there. Oh. Go ahead, just follow yeah, up, Joel. Is there, is, there, is there anybody that you heard from in particular that you didn't expect to hear from <laughs> in Tech? Uh, I, like I had over 300 and something messages, so I, a few people I hadn't heard from in a while, and they're not on my text chain, so that probably means I haven't heard from them since I got my new phone which is about 10 months ago. But I think sometimes when you, when you have a, a national spotlight uh, and, and you've been in it as long as I have, you, you hear from really good people. So I was very flattered by that. Right behind, fourth row. Damien Sortle at Lunchburg News in advance. Uh, spoke last night a lot about Caleb, but for a offense that is as unselfish or a team that's as unselfish as this one, for Caleb to put up 30 points is a rarity. As you've had time to look back at it, how special was the night that he had to 
put this team on his back and get this team to the second round? Yeah, I just think he was cooking. You know, he, he felt it. I think when he got fouled with whatever, however much time was left when we were down 10 and he went to the line and he made three, just seeing the ball go in uh, consistently, I think, uh, usually lends for, for a heightened sense of, uh, of the rim being bigger. And uh, it seemed like for Caleb it was like that. So, uh, but again, our, the, the guys that were on the floor with him at the same time did, I thought, uh, Yeoman's work in trying to get him some good looks and, and they really had a spirit of execution down the stretch. So, uh, but Caleb, is, he's terrific. He's, again, he's, he's a multi-tooled player offensively and he's not just a scorer. Uh, but but he knew we needed him to score last night, and he did a great job. Front row on the left. Uh, Josh Jubow, Associated Press, mm -hmm. just in scouting them. What did you see out of Justin Robinson in his first game back last night, and how does his presence change, uh, he's change what they do? Five is special. He's a tremendous player. I think he's a pro. Uh, he's got unbelievable vision. What he brings to Vir Virginia Tech is a heightened sense of confidence. Uh, I, I, obviously, he'll probably have to shake off some rust, but uh, he's a terrific player. He's uh, he's one of the best guards that we faced all year, and we faced some really good ones. So uh, I, I expect him to have a, a major impact on the game. Uh, we're going to go back about six rows back. Coach Travis yeah. Wales, WDBJ in Roanoke. This yeah. is similar to Mark's question, but back in 2015, I, I think Tech and Liberty – combined for four conference wins and 46 losses. Now that you guys are going to play in the Sweet 16, do you see some similarities in the way, the trajectory of the two schools and the way that you've tried to build things in Lynchburg and the way Buzz has kind of done things in Blacksburg? <laughs> um, if I'm compared to Buzz as a coach, that's a compliment. But Buzz is, if you know Buzz, he's so eccentric. Like, he's, he's uh He's he's different, and and I mean it in a positive way. I actually have so much respect for the type of program that he's built. I went up there, I want to say, about nine months ago, and just spent about a half a day with him. And like his mind thinks way differently. Uh, the stuff he does, the journaling, the like he's he's a master at it. So, uh, do I think there's some similarities? I, th I think both programs are invested in the pursuit of excellence. I think both administrations really support our basketball programs and have given us or afforded us the opportunity and the resources to build a program. And, um, and, I, and I think they have a different type of player than we do, uh, but I, I think we both recruit to our systems. On the right side, third row. Josh Peter with USA Today. Um, I didn't realize you were serious yesterday about In-N-Out Burger, and I was hoping you could tell us about the trip and its place in uh, Liberty history. Uh, I didn't go to In-N-Out Burger. The, the players did. Uh, they dropped us off at the hotel. When you, when you are my weight and my body fat, you get exempted from opportunities like that. So, uh, but I think the players enjoyed it, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was good. I need to have a little fun once in a while. And what did you end up eating? Uh, I think I had a bar, a snack bar from, it might have been from the locker room in there. I just, yeah, I try not to eat too late. And, yeah, I ate a lot this morning. There we go, second row on the left. Uh, Regina, in a quick turnaround game like this, is it is it helpful that you had that experience of playing them in, in early November in an exhibition game? Or was it so long ago in such a meaningless game that you, you can't glean anything, remember anything from that? It might be helpful from the standpoint we know their personnel and we've seen them before, but they're way different than they were in November. He didn't even have any offense in in November. Now he's got 172 plays in, so yeah, way different. Uh, but we're different, and and I think we've improved. We we played in a really competitive league against uh, some really well coached teams, especially Lipscomb. I think they're I think they won today in the NIT. So uh, I think we're different and we're a little better. <laughs> standing right next to the chairs left coach Jermaine Farrell WFXR in Roanoke again congratulations thank you for making it to the round of 32 you know spending some time talking to some of your players they all have unique stories and they all talk about the impact that you've had on them not only as a coach but also as a player I mean as a uh, for them 
What do you feel is the biggest impact you think you've left on your players and the run that they've made so far? Um, thank you for your compliment. I, I think for me, having left Liberty uh, the first time and going to Virginia, I think it was really healthy for my person. And, uh, and I got back to being uh, a transformational coach instead of a transactional coach. So uh, now I'm way more invested in the individual uh, not to say I was bad, uh, I'm just more intentional about it now, and that's um, because of Christ in me, not because of any great thing that I do. But so, so I really care for them, and uh, and I think we have created a uh, a group of of people that lead our program and our assistant coaches and support staff, our administration. I think our universities like this that we want we want their best interests, and we have it. Uh, we have their best interests at heart, and uh, I think when you're I said this yesterday, when you're not outcome-based, but you're process or uh, pursuant of just getting better as a person, I think, I think that frees you up to, to have some, to be able to fail and still be unconditionally loved. In the front row. Hey, Michael Phillips with the Richmond Times-Dispatch. At the uh, charity game you guys did in November, Buzz shared that um, he did not always like you, um, apparently, <laughs> and uh, that as a young assistant, he uh, had some choice words for you during a game once. I was just curious, from your perspective, how that relationship has evolved over time. Well, Buzz was really immature, and obviously, <laughs> I, yeah, that we were we let our competitive nature get the best of us in the moment. But uh, I, I just told someone in another interview that uh, he then invited me some. I don't know how many years later. Uh, on his plane when he was going from the Peach Jam in Atlanta or Augusta, Georgia to uh, an event in Milwaukee. And I, I was scheduled to fly the next morning and I had to stop somewhere to get back there. I was going to miss a half a day of the games. Mm -hmm. and he said, why don't you jump on the plane with me? And I was a little, a little hesitant. What kind of plane is this? Made sure I checked for the eject sheet uh, s switch. Uh, but we spent probably two, two and a half hours on the plane, and uh, I was like, man, I so misread this book, the cover of this book, because he's, he's special. And uh, we've, we've gotten to know each other fairly well, and uh, I think a lot of Buzz Williams and his family, I think they're tremendous people. Second row. Uh, to follow up, Richie, on what you said about your team being different from back in early November there in the exhibition game, how has this team evolved since then, and are some of the differences some qualities that can help you uh, beat the Hokies tomorrow. Well, true with every team that is committed to the pack. I think we're better defensively. Um, Justin Robinson, I'm sorry, five is a hard equation to uh, to solve. But uh, so was uh, Peters last night for Mississippi State. Um, without giving up our game plan, I, I just think uh, we're a program that tries to stay in our lane. And uh, offensively, we, we do some things that uh, we try and take advantages of the way defenses play us. And then defensively, we we try and – I'm not going to go Buzz Williams on you and tell you how many paint touches or how many box touches that you need. He, he's way – again, he's way, he's way too eccentric and smart. Um, but I do think if, we, if we're if we able to, to, to take some good shots and, uh, and take care of the ball, and then defensively if we can make them earn, I think hopefully we can have a chance. Fourth row left. How much are you looking for Scotty to have a bounce back game after he, he seemed like he was somewhat out of it with what Mississippi State was able to do with their length and athleticism and really affect his shots? I, I never worry about Scotty. I've seen him every day now for three years. He is a phenomenal player. And uh, again, I don't equate his impact on our game on his statistics. He's He, uh, he didn't have a usual Scotty James night, but I uh, have every bit of confidence that uh, that could change the next time we uh, put the uniform on. Anything additional? <laughs> Looks like we're good. All right, thanks, Thank Coach. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay, we'll have uh, Virginia Tech student athletes at 3.55. About 12 minutes from now, 12 minutes.
Looks like keep the microphone. You want to pull up? Get him in the get him in the action a little bit. But just you keep the mic. No, no, no. Did you change microphones? <coughs> What's that? Yeah, you you changed. No, changed. No, no, no. The, the actual microphone. Don't. Yeah. Okay. You left it there. Okay. I'm sorry. Gotcha. That's for. No pressure. All right, the Virginia Tech student athletes are on their way. This will be our final team for the day. Uh, just a reminder, if you can check your cell phones, put those on mute or turn them off. Uh, no video in the room, just uh, still photography only. And uh, locker rooms will be open at this point for about 40 minutes or so. So we'll have the student athletes and then Coach Buzz Williams at about 4.15. Okay, well, welcome the Virginia Tech student athletes to the dais. Um, joining us are Rabisa Beatty, Nikhil Alexander Walker, and Kerry Blackshear Jr. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. We've got mics on either side. Raise your hand. Um, just give us your name and affiliation for that first question. 
and uh, we're ready. We'll go on the second row to the left. Hey guys, um, has it sunk for any of you? Has it sunk in that you know the season's kind of come full circle? Yet you started the year playing these guys in a preseason exhibition, and now here you are, all these months later, and you're going to meet meet now in a in a game with much uh, bigger stakes tomorrow in the NCAA tournament. Um, not really. Uh, it was a good experience. Um, it was for a good cause for hurricane relief. Um, we're glad that we can uh, use our platform to do such a big thing for the people that suffered from that tragedy. But um, it, it's good that we have a scout, uh, someone that we already played. Um, so we're not trying to in, uh, learn about a team in 24 hours where we kind of have a good feel for them. So I think that'll help. Um, like Nikhil said, it was, like, it was a good cause for hurricane relief. Um, and it's the biggest thing is like we don't have a big enough scout because it's a huge turnaround. Um, we wish we did, um, but we know we're going to be follow the scouting report what coach gives us, and we're going to execute it. Um, at this point in the season, we're both completely different teams, so that game might not even matter as much. But um, we're excited to be at this stage and um, have an opportunity to extend our season. You answer questions? Mark, back to you. Obviously, everyone was pretty excited yesterday, finally getting that, that first NCAA tournament win in a, in a while there. Um, how has the mindset shifted now in terms of, you know, now you want to get a, another one and make it to the Sweet 16? You know, uh, are you guys still kind of riding high from yesterday, or has or the mindset now changed? Never want to be uh, complacent, but uh, always thankful for the moment. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful, um, but I can't go back to yesterday. And uh, it's kind of moving forward. And... You want to keep uh, going. You never want the season to end short. Um, I love my teammates, uh, my seniors as well. And so as, as long as I get to play with them, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to keep the season going. Third row left. Joel Anderson, ESPN. Um, you guys took the suspense out of that game last night really early. Um, you, know, you guys jumped on St. Louis really early. So I don't know how much of the other games you guys got to see, but you saw a lot of upsets early. Did any of that, did you guys, just something you all talked about or something you all noticed that, you know, the, the underdogs kind of got the upper hand all throughout the day until you guys stepped on the floor? Um, we just didn't want that to happen to us. We all were talking about it. Um, the seniors, especially at Med Hill, was talking about, like, just go with a fight. We have to step, um, keep fighting and don't let, like, we didn't want that happening to us. He just wanted that, us to play hard and be like a dog throughout the whole game and don't let up. Go back on the fifth row, left. Norm Wood, Daily Press, uh, Newport News, Virginia. Nikhil, you were talking last night about the fact that it'll be cool to be in San Jose and see you know, a bunch of fans from Liberty and a bunch of fans from Virginia Tech and how it'll feel like a game for Virginia. <clears throat> for any of you guys, I know none of you are from the state of Virginia, but this will be the first time in the history of the tournament that two teams from the state of Virginia have played each other. Does that kind of add another odd element to this matchup where, you know, it's just sort of a, an, an, an odd setup and an odd meeting to be on the opposite coast and play this game where it has such a Virginia-centric feel to it? I think it's cool. Um, like you said, uh, it's a first. For me, that's the first time I even heard that. I didn't know. Uh, it's kind of – funny how many statistics there are in this world. But um, just to know that we get the chance to have the opportunity to play in the first game ever. Um, and you kind of want to have the, the bragging rights, per se, or the upper hand to say that you won that first game. And it's just about focus. Uh, we can control uh, who we are and what we do. We can't control where it is, uh, who's it against. But just as much as what we're doing to win the game is what's more important. Additional um, questions? Oh, oh, sorry, keep going. Sorry. Um, for me personally, um, I think it's so much history on the line for this game that I guess that just adds to the bat. Um, we're just excited to be able to be here, um, extend our season, um, play with this group of guys one more time. This group of guys want to be together after this season. So I think that's um, what's most exciting for us. And um, I think it's a big game. Mark, back to you, second row. 
I know how much you guys have started talking about li Liberty and tomorrow and, and looking back at the exhibition game, but is there anything you want to, you thought you guys did pretty well in that exhibition game in November that you kind of want to bottle and, and do again tomorrow? Um, I don't remember it too, vivid, too vividly. So, I mean, uh, we won, so I think we defended well. Um, but it was our first really, like, actual setting with referees in the game and an away crowd. And so I think um, now it's a, it's a whole different team. Uh, everyone's grown so much as players and talent-wise, discipline-wise, maturity-wise. So I think that it was a good uh, test for us early in the season. But that chapter is closed, and it's a new season, and uh, we're embarking on a new chapter. So I feel that. Um, everything, like KJ said, has kind of gone out the window. Um, it's March. As you see, upsets can happen at any time. Um, so what you did before kind of doesn't matter anymore. It's a uh, win or go home, and that's how it is. Anything additional? It sounds like we're good. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll have uh, Coach Buds Williams in about 10 minutes. Just uh, to let you know, the locker room is open currently if you wanted to run down there briefly and come back.
Virginia Tech coach Buzz Williams. Just a uh, reminder, no video, just uh, still photography. Um, and just for anybody that just popped in, just check your cell phone, make sure that's on mute or vibrate. All right, we will uh, open it up to questions. We've got mics on either side. Just uh, name and affiliation on the uh, first go around, please. And we'll, oh, so, okay, we'll go, yep, back there, <laughs> standing left. Coach Jermaine Farrell, WFXR in Roanoke. Uh, first of all, again, congratulations on making it to the next round. One neat thing I think about your program I noticed is the, the shirts that you wear, obviously, during the post-game press coverage and the players are wearing. I think it's pretty cool. If you could give us a little background of how all that got started and uh, overall, how many t-shirts you think you've given out to your players or so? Thanks for asking. Thanks for even noticing. Uh, we call them quote shirts. Uh, you can't get a quote shirt unless there is a tech talk behind it, tech as in Virginia Tech. I think it's just another opportunity for um, – us to teach our guys maybe a life lesson, maybe something that's bigger than basketball. There was one quote shirt that was basketball specific in year number one. Um, that was the only one that has anything to do with basketball. Everything else is um, specific to life. Um, the ones that I wear after the game, it's kind of the only time that I ever wear them. I don't ever want it to come across arrogant because most of those quotes are quotes that I say, not necessarily um, my original words. Some of them are, but we make five extra ones for anyone not in our program. So anyone not in our program that has a quote shirt, either the quote was attributed to them. Uh, Gus Bradley's here. We have a quote shirt from Coach Gus when he was with us. Um, It's just kind of become a part of the fabric of what we do. Depends upon the year. I think um, we gave our guys their last quote shirt on the Monday before we left, the Monday we left for Charlotte. And so that was the 11th quote shirt of the year. But I would say uh, you could see a wall in our facility. It has um, the artwork from every quote shirt and the lesson under the quote. I think they average about 13 a year. So however many that is. Approaching 70 in our time here. Thanks for asking. Front row on the left. Uh, Buzz, in a, in a quick turnaround, quick scout, is it, is it helpful to you guys that you know, you, you, see, you see the pack line defense a couple times this year already with playing Virginia and the fact that you were on the same court with these guys in an exhibition game in early November? I don't think so. I, I think you can tweet about it and it makes sense. But um, I, I don't think at this stage uh, when we play tomorrow with however many teams will be remaining in the field, 20, games le 20 teams left in the country playing for a national championship, I don't think something that happened 139 days ago, I don't think that there's much carryover. That's not who they are now. It's not who we are now. Um, they're playing for their 30th win. And statistically, if you look at the metrics that matter the most, um, they're very impressive. Almost uh, better than half of the teams in the ACC on the numbers that smart people pay attention to. But um, I, I don't know that – I mean, I don't even remember that far back in how we operate. I just think that that's – in dog years, that was so so long ago. Coach, this is Nick Pierce from the uh, Liberty Flame Sports Network. Uh, is that a TV station? It is. We have TV and radio, actually. Yeah. For the students? No, for the for the old people like me. Interesting. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm on the radio side, though. I uh, just wanted to ask you kind of uh, on the uh, uh, 
previous question about the pack line defense facing it twice against Virginia. What comparisons, similarities, and is there between UVA and Liberty? And how would you uh, how would you say maybe facing UVA helps a couple times going into this? Well, it's, I, I I try not to go to the dentist because when you play UVA, that's that's what it's like. You know, it's just um, it'll be a very slow game. Um, I do think that how I'm not trying to coach coach his team, but I do think that if you read what he says uh, and how they go about their business, I think defensively a lot of what they do is very similar to what UVA does. Um, that whole coaching tree, uh, Coach Bennett, Coach Bennett's dad, uh, Coach McKay, all of uh, Brad Soderberg, all of those guys are kind of uh, from that grouping. And I think, you know, how they defend ball screens, how they defend the post, uh, the pack line, the imaginary line that they want to – it's the force field that the ball can't get to. I, I think it's – it's very similar. Um, I don't know that there's any other team that we've played against this year that are 1,000% pack line. Louisville has a lot of that. Coach Mack plays some of that, but it's not uh, the original Dick Bennett, this is pack line, I'm inventing a new defense. It, I don't think anybody else does that the way that UVA and Liberty do. Second row in the middle. Uh, Michael Phillips with the Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, it, it, Barber didn't want to come. Barber went to see UVA. He said he was ducking you. I don't. Is that right? Just relaying the message. That, you'll, you'll probably pick up on the same attribute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it seems like uh, you, your seniors and, and the upperclassmen have a, a pretty good feel for what you're trying to accomplish and, and can coach internally. I would imagine that's the goal of any coach. But uh, it, how satisfying has that been to see, and how does that play itself out in the day to day? Well, I think the I think. Um, Okay, programs are typically coach-led. I think good, good, uh, good programs. It's kind of a mix. Maybe some coaches and some players. I think uh, sustainable, successful programs. It's normally player-led, um, and that that takes time. And even with time, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It speaks to the character of our guys. I think it speaks to their IQ and their EQ. Those old guys that have been, I mean, Med's known me since he was a sophomore in, in high school. Uh, and I think there's some, it, it's never written about, and maybe it shouldn't be uh, because it, it would make too much sense. But um, my staff, a lot of those guys have been around me a long time as well, right? Uh, half of our staff either played for me or was a manager or a GA. And so it's, kind of the culmination of all of that to the point that I'm probably uh, the least used cog in the wheel because uh, the staff, the players, the former players, kind of how they've morphed and how they've grown is way better than what I would have done if I would have led it on my own. And so um, I think that's what you want as you're building an organization for there to be some continuity, not just in how you play, but Maybe the why is maybe more important than the how. Front row left. Uh, to follow up what you were saying about Liberty is a different team than they were back in November. So from what film you've seen of them today, it's what concerns you the most about the team they are now? Well, they're tenth in the country in effective field goal percentage. You know, and I know that it's a it's an easy storyline. It's the pack line. It's Tony Bennett. It's Richie McKay. It's Dick Bennett. I get all of that. Um, but they're tenth in the country in effective field goal percentage. That's that's very impressive. Um, they haven't lost a game in over a month. Um, they won their championship game on the team that they tied with to win the league. That's very impressive. I don't know if you saw uh, that game, but that was a great college basketball game. And even the game that they played last night, I don't know um, – I know the 5-12 matchup is popular in Vegas, but that was um, – Liberty won that game. And uh, Liberty was never out of the game, no matter what Mississippi State was doing. And so, as effective as they are defensively, and obviously that slows the game down, for them to be as efficient as they are 
offensively is is um, I mean that's that's why their metrics are so good. I mean the their net, their Kim Palm, all the stuff that matters. That's why they're they're still playing. To be honest, left fifth row back. Yeah, hey Buzz, uh, Roman Subs, Washington Post. Uh, I know you talked a little bit about it after the exhibition in November, but uh, about your relationship with Richie. Um, that encounter when you were at Colorado State, he was at New Mexico. What do you remember about that? And and after that, just how your guys' relationship evolved? Yeah, I, I worked for a coach at uh, Colorado State, and uh, Richie used to be a graduate assistant for coach. And so, um, of course, I, I did not know any of that. Uh, when coach hired me, I didn't know to, I didn't know coach. I'd never been to Colorado. It wasn't like it was a a wired deal. Um, like, like m maybe most young coaches under 30, uh, I was probably hell bent on the wrong things with a lot of it being selfish in nature. Um, I, I remember what happened. If you want to talk about it, we can. Uh, it was a big Monday game. That was when the Mountain West Conference played the game after Sports Center. You were, if you were living in Richmond, you were already asleep when that game came on. Uh, but for somebody that was 28 years old and employed at a school that didn't have a direction in it or a hyphen in it, that was a big deal to play on national TV. Uh, where I'm from, I never had cable until I became a coach. And uh, so, like, Big Monday was pretty cool. And so, um, Coach Lair, I've never heard say a word of profanity ever. And uh, n never have I heard Coach McKay say a word of profanity. And so, I for sure skewed the numbers in that regard. And Coach wouldn't allow me to use profanity, and, and I did that night. And uh, I, I probably didn't handle myself in the right way. But I think... To talk about that would be even more immature on my part because my relationship with him uh, has completely morphed into something totally different. And I have the utmost respect not only for what he does as a coach, but maybe more importantly, who he is as a person and the impact that he's had as a coach. Okay, we're going to go in the middle, fifth row. Hi, Coach. David Lombardi from The Athletic. I, I just talked to Justin Robinson, and he was mentioning that while he was hurt, that he felt that he was beginning to see the game even more as a player and a coach, That, that and he, he looks up to you, and that he is able to analyze things from uh, in a manner that he wants to be a coach, he said, after, after he plays. I'm wondering what your assessment of his kind of cerebral um, – take on the game is and and if you do see him, him being a coach one day uh, for sure he'll be a coach he'll be incredibly successful uh, if I'm still coaching I'll try to hire him probably won't have enough money to to afford him um, Jamie McNeely was a player on my was a player who's now on my staff and as a young coach I thought he was the best player I had been around that could take what I was saying and translate it to the players that couldn't understand it. Uh, and five is the second best. Um, I think he'll be ultra successful because he has uh, a level of charisma about him, kind of has a level of swag about him, but it's not uh, too boisterous. It's not arrogant. I thought he was very important and helpful in the 12 games that he set out. Obviously, as a senior, as the all-time leader in assists, you don't want to sit out. Um, I don't know how many games that we lost that we would have won when he played, but uh, for him to be a Virginia kid and to be a part of the evolution of our program, I think that that was incredibly difficult. But how he handled it spoke, speaks to who he is. Um, he sees the game a lot faster than I do. He's been one of, if not the most important person in the change in our program. And maybe that's because of he's always to the next play, particularly when the ball's in his hand. He just he makes the game so much easier for Ahmed, game easier for Nikhil, game easier for Ty, but everybody that he's played against. I mean, when he was a freshman and starting, we were playing Seth Allen. 
and Seth Allen was as good with the ball in his hands as, as I've been around. But when five has the ball, I just think it's uh, – you're too young to know the, the group, the Eagles. They had a song, Peaceful, Easy Feeling. And, like, when five has the ball, that's – I think everybody feels that way. Our guys don't listen to that genre of music, but I do. So, like, you know, like when five has the ball yesterday, I know statistically it wasn't uh, his normal game. But he – in the 27 minutes that he played, he was a big part of handling St. Louis's pressure, handling their physicality. Because when he has the ball, you know he's going to make the right decision. And a lot of times, I think the decision that he makes, he's skipping – if it's A, B, C, he's skipping B. He's going from A to C. And unless you've been around him a long time, you never even knew that there was a B. And uh, so – I think he'll end up playing for a long time. Um, I think the right team that uh, values having an IQ, values a great teammate, I think he'll stick with the right team at the highest level. But when he's done playing, I think he'll ha have an even greater impact as a coach. Uh, his, his ability to influence not only his team, but like in Buzz's Bunch and all of the other things that we do in the community is just – he has a, a – he's very much a magnet to kids and his ability. I mean, like my kids, my, my children, they think five hung the moon, you know. And uh, when five got hurt at Miami, that next day it was rough at our house, you know, because our, our, my children thought we were going to lose every game. They were – it was my children in Berman, you know, that were – the wheels are falling off. And so – that tells you how much they think of five. <laughs> uh, so, well, let's, let's go to Berman on the left. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Even you know who Berman is. <laughs> um, I don't know if it sunk in. You know, you started the preseason playing that you had the charity exhibition game at the Vine Center, and you were sat there with Richie in the, on the podium there in the postgame. Yeah, and conference. I gave him some money. Did you ask Richie about this? I gave money to that ministry. Oh, that's right. And they never cashed the check until after the new year. That must be a Falwell deal, right? Don't you, when you donate to charity, don't you want to count it in? The, my CPA said you want to count that in the 2018. I don't have a CPA, so you're, oh. you're different, uh, different. As skilled as you are, I'm surprised. But uh, you know, starting, you know, being with Richie and, and the teams back then, and now kind of come full circle, and here you are, these many months later, with Richie again and these teams again in the NCAA tournament. I mean, has has that kind of did that strike you at all today or last night? Uh. I, I'm, I'm real happy for him, and I mean that in a sincere way. Um, if, if you rewind, uh, I know he's older than me, but if you rewind in his career, uh, his ascent was as fast as any head coach ever. And the thing that I find, um, in addition to that ascent, was – the AD at Liberty when he left was the same AD that hired him back. And I don't know if you could Google that in college basketball. I don't think that that's ever occurred. And I think that that just speaks to who he is. Yes, it speaks to that he's a very good coach. But to leave an institution and then come back and the people that are making the decisions – bring you back um i think that that probably is the most unique measurement uh relative to his career last year not this season last year when um the hurricanes affected one hit houston one hit puerto rico you know the ncaa allowed us to add an exhibition uh, as long as the monies went towards those uh, in the relief of those victims. This year, the NCAA did not allow that. And so we had our typical annual scrimmage with South Carolina, and then Liberty was scheduled to come to our place for the scrimmage. 
and then we were able to work it out where we would just turn the scrimmage into an exhibition so that we could raise some money for that. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't know, uh, Berman, that it kind of crossed my mind yesterday. Um, the answer to that. I'm just a uh, typical coach. You know, I'm so wired for that particular game. Um, what was at stake? Um, what it would mean to our institution? What it would mean to our program? What it would mean to these kids and these families that believed in something that wasn't there four or five years ago? Uh, maybe it's crossed my mind today, but not that it's um, – from a competitive standpoint, more from an admiration standpoint. Uh, I have great admiration for Coach, for who he is. Um, I think that was the first win for him in the NCAA tournament. Is that right? Uh, 17 years as a head coach, and yesterday was his first win. I would assume since it was his first win that it was probably the first win for Liberty as an institution. So. Uh, I don't ever look at coach as a competitive in a competitive lens. Um, so I don't know that I necessarily looked at it like November the 4th on a Sunday. Can you believe we had the exhibition on Sunday at Liberty? Isn't that, I don't think we should do that either. But um, I went to church that morning. I don't know if Richie did, but. I, I don't look at it in that regard. Obviously, by the time we play tomorrow evening, obviously that's what it'll be. But I just look to him with great admiration and, and happiness for him and for his family. Okay, second row here, last one. Um, I'd like to go back to the quote shirts, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I did a bad job answering that. Well, let's take another crack at it. Um, if, if you don't mind taking me, I don't know how, how far back you've done that uh, among your many stops, but, but what the origin of that was and kind of what you want to communicate with it. Yeah, so uh, my brain works in fragmented sentences. So here's some potential quote shirts for upcoming years. Clarity of purpose creates perspective. I would have to massage that for a while to get it where our guys would understand it. If it doesn't challenge you, comma, it won't change you. That's a good one. An appreciation, not an expectation. That's one thing that we've talked about a lot over the last month in our program, that trying to figure out um, how to do it. So on my calendar, there's just all kind of random fragmented sentences. Some of them turn into a quote card. The quote shirts are really a derivative of quote cards. I haven't given out business cards for years. Um, and I never wanted to give a business card out because every business card has your name, your title, your information. And I always, at the very core of that, thought that that was arrogant. So when I became a head coach, I quit giving out business cards. And I created... Uh, quote cards and before I met Josh Chambers they were like the most kindergarten quote cards ever uh, and Josh is now on our staff and like they're the best graphics of all time so anytime I send something in the mail I include a quote card uh, anytime that um, I meet somebody I have a quote card and we have a different quote card every day so any day that we work I have a quote card so anytime we watch film, I give everybody a quote card. When I give them the quote card, I give them a mini tech talk. What does this mean to you? Do you understand it? And then I give them my perspective on it. Anytime we gain traction or something is better than a quote card, uh, it has turned into a quote shirt. So just in random conversation, if our guys hear something or if our guys say something and they know it's, they would use the word fire if they know it's fire they'll say coach that's a quote shirt uh so ahmed has every quote shirt that we've ever made here uh 5k and ty have every quote shirt over the last four probably equals uh one quote shirt every 20 to 24 days and at the end of the year every person that's a player on scholarship on our team puts on their favorite quote shirt, and we take a picture. And then I take the 
my quilt shirt and cut it out, and I have a lady that makes me a quilt. So every year I have a quilt of the quilt shirts from that year. Every year we have a theme for the year. Our mantra is get better, but within that mantra there's a theme for the year. I don't ever say it publicly, but for that theme there is a logo. And so uh, depending upon uh, who the guy from Roanoke was asking, I don't have one on, but you'll find a logo on uh, the quote shirt, and that logo will be specific to that year. So year two was a ladder. Uh, year three was the Bohemian rings. Uh, year four was true north, so it, it kind of looked like a uh, compass. Uh, year five is the number five, but it looks like it has four fingers coming off the curve in the five, and each of those four fingers kind of like the pylons at Virginia Tech. Um, so they know what year that that quote shirt came from. And I think the best thing about those quote shirts is if you ask our kids what the lesson was, they would be pretty accurate in describing it. Okay, great. Thanks, Coach. You bet. And folks? All right, that concludes today's sessions for interviews. Um, backstage opens tomorrow at 12.10. Courtside opens at 2.10.